Busser from the Gustav Rossi and talking about gastrointestinal toxicity, proton pump inhibitors and the microbiome. So please. So many thanks for the invitation. Sorry, I have some problem. So I'm Lisa De Rosa, uh, medical oncologist and postdoc in the lab of Laurent Zitvogel in Gustave Roussy. And uh, this is my disclosure slide. When I started my PhD at Gustave Roussy, this was my first experiment. So I kissed a plate and this is what I got. A pretty collage of bacteria and colonies with the shape of my lips. So I promise you, I'm healthy, just we are really made up of bacteria. So a standard man of 70 kilograms of weight, it would compose by among 39 trillions of microbes and 30 trillion of human cells. So the ratio is 1.3 bacteria to every one human cells. And these bacteria are really important for the host, and they are able to um, help in the maturation of the immunosystems. So there is a kind of uh, uh, equilibrium between cancer, microbiome, cancer, immunity. There are several factors involved in this, in this equilibrium named cancer immunoset point. What is the cancer immunoset point? It's a kind of threshold that must be surpassed for a patient to respond to immunotherapy. As, as you can see here, in the complexity of the anti-cancer immunity, there is also the microbiome, so the host. The host is involved. And the, quest the big question is, could a minimalist microbiome normalize the cancer immunoset point? So, uh, I would like to define the clinical relevance of the composition of the gut microbiome in cancer patients. So the clinical relevance means response and toxicity. Microbiome is involved in the response to immunotherapy, is involved in the uh, toxicity to immunotherapy. So does the gut microbiota impact, really impact in the cancer immunotherapy? To answer this question, we use mice. At first, we demonstrated that anti-cancer efficacy, anti-tumor efficacy of anti-cancer immunotherapy requires gut bacteria. So in normal con condition, sorry, I think it's this, here, we have a response. So uh, the tumor responds to immunotherapy, but in germ-free condition, you lose the efficacy of the immunotherapy and also after antibiotic treatment. So you lose the efficacy of uh, cyclophosphamide, um, nivolumab, or the combination of them. Uh, and then um, we uh, check the patients and we look at the antibiotic use in, the, um, in patients treated with immunotherapy. And we show that antibiotics reduce survival of advanced cancer patients. So um, we, you lose survival after treatment with anti-PD-1 or anti-PDL-1. And it was uh, uh, the treatment with antibiotic taken two months before or one month after the first administration of PD-1 or PDL-1. But uh, there was no differences. One, when we look at, at proton pop inhibitor treatment or corticosteroids. Um, we check uh, uh, the literature and uh, we show that antibiotics related dysbiosis has a recovery time. Full recovery takes up to uh, two years, but after one month, 80% recovery. So we changed our, our idea, we changed our study, and we analyzed the deleterious impact of antibiotics 30 days before starting immunotherapy, anti-PD-1, anti-PDL-1, and the combo. 
and we uh, show the deleterious impact of antibiotic. In that case, in this kind of uh, period of time, the uh, effect, the deleterious effect, was more potent. And antibiotic was a predictor of resistance also after multivariate analysis. It was a predictor of worse progression-free survival in kidney cancer patients from Gustave Rossi and worse overall survival for lung cancer patients treated with immunotherapy at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And after multivariate analysis, this rem remains the unique factor without performance status at the other. And what was interesting was in a renal cell carcinoma patient, after antibiotic use, patients were more primary resistant to immunotherapy. And uh, this was a retrospective analysis, of course, only hypothesis generation, but several reports are confirming this detrimental impact of antibiotics. We have now 12 studies, independent studies, retrospective, showing the same effect of antibiotic. But what about PPI inhibitors? So they affect the efficacy of the immunotherapy. Here the results are a little bit controversial because in no small cell lung cancer patients, the negative effect was not seen in patients receiving nivolumab, but was seen in patients receiving atezolizumab. And in melanoma patients, we have similar results. So negative effect for the combo, no negative effect for the epilimo monotherapy. But for uh, the microbiome in this kind of co-medication, this is a kind of uh, hypothesis. So for us, antibiotic inhibit proton pump inhibitor are able to change in a tra transit way the microbiome. So they uh, are able to create a dysbiosis, and this dysbiosis is able to influence the outcome. So the question is, uh, the composition of gut microbiome impact on the tumor response of treatment? So to answer this question, we um, collect the feces in our center, the feces of renal cell carcinoma patients and no small cell lung cancer patients treated with anti-PD-1. And we build a Gustavo C. Cacatec, a, a real library of stools. We collect the feces before starting anti-PD-1 and during the uh, interperiod of our treatment. And uh, we had a discovery court and a validation court of patient pooled renal cell carcinoma and no small cell lung cancer. And we looked for response, toxicity, and clinical data. And also we uh, observed all the co-medication, antibiotic, PPI inhibitor, et cetera, et cetera. And we explored the uh, microbiome using quantitative metagenomic analysis by shotgun sequencing. It's not 16S analysis. So um, we found two different, uh, mm, two different kind of uh, composition of uh, bacteria. So feces composition were different between responder and non-responder patient. There was a kind of uh, immune response profile regardless tumor type, because here we have lung cancer patient and renal cell carcinoma patient pooled together. As, as you can see, there was a signature for responders and the first bacteria was Ackermansia mucinifila, was most abundant in responder patients, even in the discovery court and also in the validation court. And then to validate the significance, to characterize the microbiota in our patient, we decided to extend the analysis in France, and now we, uh, we are trying to um, build a kind of uh, um, CAC in France for the lung cancer patients to try to uh, show the influence of antibiotic, PPI, and other co-medication in the response to the treatment. And in parallel, we are working on renal cell carcinoma, and we are collecting feces in the Nivoren trial, is a um, phase two trial 
um, with nivolumab in renal cell carcinoma patients. And we have 69 fe fe feces collected now, and we are again exploring the composition of gut using quantitative metagenomic analysis by shotgun sequencing, taking also in consideration the antibiotic absorption. And here we show that antibiotics really affect the outcome. Again, here antibiotic use was associated with primary resistant disease to anti-PD-1. And the composition and um, diversity was really different between antibiotic user and no antibiotic user. But the most important is excluding antibiotic patients, user, we had, again, a signature of from res different from responder to non-responder. And this kind of signature, again, we found Acarmansia mucinifila and another bacteria, Bacteroides saliersiae. We choose, to, uh, the, uh, these, um, the, we choose Acarmansia mucinifila and Bacteroides saliersiae for the prevalence in responder patients, because 72% of non-responders do not harbor Acarmansia mucinifila, in the metagenomic signature, and 90% of no responders do not harbor Bacteroides saliersi in the metagenomic signature. So, Acarmansia mucinifila and Bacteroides saliersi probably are the key in renal cell carcinoma in our court. We need a uh, validation court outside uh, Gustave Roussy. But if you uh, look at this uh, uh, kaplan meier Patients without Bacteroides saliersi and Acarmansia mucinifila had a progression free survival of three months and a half. But when patients have Acarmansia mucinifila and Bacteroides saliersi, the uh, median progression free survival increased at 19 months. And this is statistically significant. So probably we have the signature, the gut and onco uh, microbiome signature, and we can predict non-responder uh, and responder patient, antibiotic user and no antibiotic user, and probably also proton pump inhibitor user and no proton pump inhibitor user. But how to establish the cause-effect relationship between dysbiosis and resistance to treatment? Again, we use mice and we developed a mouse model. This is uh, the RENCA, uh, so the kidney cancer uh, model. It's an orthotopic uh, tumor, and as you can see, it's uh, uh, resistant to anti-PD-1 alone, but it's sensitive to the combo, anti-PD-1 plus anti-CTL4. And after we develop an avatar mice model. This is uh, the avatar or the feces of the patients. So we recolonize antibiotic-treated mice with the feces from kidney cancer patients. We use uh, feces from responder and feces from non-responder patients, and we treated the RENCA tumor model with combo or placebo. As, as you can see, feces composition is able to influence the anti-tumor efficacy of immunotherapy in avatar mice. Only mice receive responder feces, feces from responder patients, respond to immunotherapy. Whereas uh, mice receive no responding feces, do not respond. And the same results are with RENCA model, with no small cell lung cancer model, with melanoma, uh, model, and also using germ-free mice and no antibiotic-treated mice. So, we can say we have good feces and bad feces, but when we have bad feces, can we change this one in a good one? Good question. So, uh, we use again the avatar model and to validate the biological significance of commensal species identifying our metagenomic analysis of patients with favorable clinical outcome, we colonize mass intestine with Acarmansia mucinifila 
and or bacteroide saliersi in different condition of gut dysbiosis, so after antibiotic treatment or in germ-free mice. And here we have the result. After oral supplementation with Ackermansia mucinifila or bacteroide saliersi, here, here, or after compensation also with responder feces, we are able to restore the efficacy of the immunotherapy. Here you see is the, the tumor with placebo, treated with placebo, here combo, there are no differences, but the differences are here with acarmansia or bacteroides or the responder feces. But using another bacteroides outside our list, we have not the same effect. And this was validated, of, of course, in several um, cancer models. So, to define the clinical relevance, we can use avatar mouse models. But the next question is, there is a kind of association between microbiota and toxicity. Um, of course, the influence of the gut microbiota on toxicity has been uh, studied in several human courts. And now we are working with uh, the MD Anderson, MD Anderson in this court of uh, melanoma uh, patient treated with the combo. And we are looking for the signature for responder, but also the signature for toxicity. But there are some data. I cannot show you, I cannot show you the data, but there are some data in literature. Uh, not with combo, with anti-PD-1 or anti-PDL-1 or anti-CTLA-4 alone. And there are, there are uh, bacteria associated with response and with toxicity, or only with response and only with toxicity. And there are some kind of uh, overlap between the studies. And of course, we are working in parallel in mice and uh, uh, we analyzed the intestine of our mice after compensation with Acarmansia mucinifila or responder feces. And there are two ways to look at the colon, colic toxicity in mice. One is the um, immunostochemistry with the score, uh, and the second one is the lipocalin 2. And after uh, compensation with Acarmansia mucinifila or responder feces, there is an improvement in toxicity score and lipocalin level in combo-treated mice. So, uh, fecal microbial transplantation or administration of bacterial consortia might emerge as a therapeutic schedule in cancer patients. Here we have um, a trial ongoing in MD Anderson, in metastatic uh, melanoma patient treated with anti-PD-1, and they are, they are randomized uh, to receive placebo or fecal microbial transplantation from re complete responder patients or bacterial product, a consortia of bacteria. And the point is to look at the safety and the tolerability of the combination, of course, uh, but also the reduction of the toxicity and the increase of the response. But these are secondary endpoints. But there are a lot of questions about the selection of the most appropriate donor, so uh, feces from complete responser, feces from healthy volunteer patients, or also the optimal composition of the uh, bacteria formulation. But the way to um, modulate the microbiota are different. So uh, we can change the microbiome with fecal transplant, with uh, bacteria, with antibiotics, with communication like PPI or others, uh, prebiotic, metabolites, but of course with diet. So there are a lot of trials ongoing with uh, ketogenic diet, for example. Uh, it seems to be able to reduce toxicity to immunotherapy and also TKI in renal cell carcinoma. Um, and um, we are working 
in uh, our Kakatek, now we have a huge Kakatek. Uh, this is uh, only in uh, Gustave Russie. We are collecting in no small cell and cancer patients, um, all the GU patients, um, not only with patients with treated with immunotherapy, but also chemotherapy. Um, we have a court of healthy volunteers um, to try to use, uh, to analyze uh, uh, the differences between healthy volunteer and uh, cancer, different type of cancer. And the idea uh, is to analyze feces not only by metagenomic analysis, not only using fecal microbiome transplantation, but also using culturomics analysis. It's a new kind of uh, analysis where you can analyze of the, um, all the bacteria death and non, not. And metabolomic, to try to uh, see if uh, metabolites of bacteria are also important for the response to immunotherapy, the reduction of the toxicity, etc., etc. And after we are working in the um, Oncobiome trial. Oncobiome trial is a European network where we are collecting feces in no small cell and cancer patients colorectal cancer patient, breast cancer, and also melanoma. But in that case, we are not uh, just working on, um, only working resistance and toxicity, but also in the incidence and prognosis, because probably we can use feces to uh, try to screen in our patients. So, uh, in conclusion, gut dysbiosis compromise the efficacy of the immunotherapy in patients and in mice. Mouse models suggest um, that modulation of the gut microbiome can enhance responses to immune checkpoint blockage and prevent toxicity. Mapping the gut microbiota to identify a minimalist ecosystem governing the cancer immune set point remains an open enigma for now. Ongoing prospective worldwide study to confirm microbiota signature there are, and novel approaches to treat cancer patients from screening to diagnosis and to treatment based on understanding microbiota composition and method to modulate the microbiota to boost immune checkpoint blocked activity and reduce toxicity are needed. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much in, for this exciting presentation, I have to say. Um, I guess there's going to be many questions. Maybe I start. You showed the study where feces of patients who had a complete response are going to be given to kind of patients as an intervention to modulate the microbiome. How well do the tumors have to match between the recipient and the donor? For example, in lung cancer, could you use a patient who had a complete response for an adenocarcinoma and use that for a patient having a squamous cell carcinoma? How well do, have, do the tumors have to match? Uh, we are working a lot on this, and for this we are analyzing healthy volunteer compared to cancer patients. But uh, the idea is that we have a core common gut onco microbiome signature, and probably we can use the feces for different patients. So not just uh, feces from non small cell lung cancer for the same uh, kind of tumor, but uh, we are still working on this. And also, when I started, you saw um, the idea was to um, have a gut onco microbiome signature for immune response. And we found a Carmansia mucinifila, and we have refound a Carmansia mucinifila also in renal cell carcinoma. So probably there is a kind of uh, group of bacteria important for the response to immunotherapy, for the reduction of the toxicity, and the other, we have 39 trillion of uh, microbes, but probably the other are not so important. So probably we can use uh, feces from cancer patient responder to immunotherapy for uh, the response to immunotherapy, independently from the type of cancer. But we, are, uh, we have to validate this information. For now, it's melanoma for melanoma, etc., etc. 
Are there more questions, Rolf? I was wondering, you know, there's these geographic differences in prevalence of certain cancers. One, in the old days, one said it has to do with diet. Is there an indication it has to do with the microbiome differences? Yes, we have a lot of differences, uh, but uh, uh, the genetic and the diet are not so important. It depends from this. And the idea uh, of the second network is just to validate this information. So um, European centers collect feces and uh, there is a kind of cross-validation between different countries just to try to uh, understand if the nationality is really important and also diet, be because diet influences also the microbiome. Uh, but for now, um, we can say that there are trials, there are studies that show that uh, a patient in another country could have the same microbiome than mine. Hmm. But it depends a little bit from uh, trials. So thank you. That was a lovely talk. Um, what I what I didn't really see from from the talk is is what is it about a patient who has is lucky enough to have acromantia in their gut at the time they start this treatment that's different from a patient who unfortunately didn't win that ticket in the lottery and doesn't have that because presumably and I know nothing about acromantia but we're all given the opportunity to eat it or to have it in our microbiome and some of us do and some of us don't. And what do we know about the biology that allows the gut to be colonized by those bugs, which presumably is the underlying biology about how does the patient's immune system then go on and attack the cancer. So fantastic series of studies, but I didn't see any, uh, any data on that or any thoughts on that in your presentation. Yes. Um, but this is because, uh, of course, Acarmansia mucinifil is one of bacteria, and after there is a kind of consortium of bacteria involved, and the mechanism in this presentation, of course, is missed, because the mechanism on uh, immune system, because we are still working on this, and uh, in part we can say that probably there is a kind of cross-reactivity between uh, some immunostimulating bacteria and our immune system in the tumor, but there are several other factors involved in this kind of uh, uh, collaboration between bacteria and response to immunotherapy. And uh, all of the biology data are still uh, ongoing. And, and when you give somebody a transplant containing acromantia, when they've gone the whole of their life without being colonized by it, does it take and does it stay there durably or does it disappear again? Do they yeah. then have an environment in their gut that will allow it to accept the transplant? So the question is if uh, what we found in the feces is after in the patient or in the mice? In general, yes. Yes, because we are working in parallel. So when you... Um, we analyze feces before fecal microbiome transplantation and after the patient collect feces during the period of time. And uh, um, in general, in mice, there is a, a, a um, commonality of 83% of bacteria. Of course, after there is the gut of the mice, etc., etc. For the patients, the data are still ongoing, but I think that uh, the human system and the antecedent of the, the host work on this, so probably it's not 100% uh, similar. Okay, I have a question. That's a wonderful talk. Um, have you looked at other factors such as uh, performance status? Have you looked at other factors such as performance status, smoking status, uh, other comorbidities that can affect the uh, microbiome? The microbiome? Yeah. Uh, performance status, no. Uh, we checked. Uh, smoking status also is a factor, but not so important. Uh, and we adjust for this in the analysis. 
And uh, the third was... Um, comorbidities. Ah, comorbidities. We checked also for comorbidities, no. Maybe la one last question, yes. Just was one question, very nice talk. Concerning Cacarmansia mucinifida, this is uh, one of the, in the probiotics that are used, for example, for patients uh, who need to lose weight by reduction yes. of glucose and reduction of also cholesterol in the blood. Did you see any values in the patients who have this Ackermansia mucinifida in the faces that you can monitor, for example, to compare blood and stool in those patients? For now, we are not working with uh, Ackermansia mucinifida in patients, so we are not uh, um, uh, adding Ackermansia mucinifida in trials, but we are, we, we are organizing a prospective trial with Ackermansia mucinifida. In mice, there are no differences in weight or uh, characteristics, no. Okay, I would like to thank